So we're happy to have Jose Figueroa Ofero uh, giving his third lecture of his series on space-time G-structures. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so let me remind you what happened last time. So I, I already wrote this uh, slide. Um, so we were discussing um, Galilean G-structures and Carolian G-structures uh, and comparing them to Lorentzian, I suppose. And the Galilean G-structures were modeled on Galilei spacetime. So basically, it consists of a manifold, a non nowhere vanishing one form, and some uh, symmetric, uh, uh, you know, contravariant rank two tensor, which defines a Riemannian structure on the kernel of this one form. And then the Carolian structure is uh, right, so it's, it's model on Carroll spacetime. So it consists of a manifold, a nowhere vanishing vector field, and a, uh, a a Riemannian metric on the quotient of uh, the tangent bundle by the line bundle generated by that uh, nowhere vanishing vector field. And then just comparing to Lorentzian G structure, which is just of course um, a Lorentzian manifold, so it's a manifold together with a Lorentzian metric. And the idea is that Galilean and Carolian, they're kind of degenerate versions of Lorentzian geometry. And uh, in the same way that uh, the Galilean Carroll spacetimes can be understood as uh, degenerate limits in which the speed of light, which, okay, in physics, of course, is something fixed, but uh, in mathematics, you could play with it. And then you can take the speed of light either to infinity or to zero, and you get these other degenerate uh, geometries. And as we mentioned, the, oops, I erased, sorry. Uh, let's go again. Um, the uh, the G and the G structures, th these are the homogeneous Galilei and homogeneous Carroll groups uh, known, so the translations are not included. And they're abstractly isomorphic, but they're not conjugate inside GLN, so they have different, uh, they're different G structures, they're not equivalent. And then what we spent most of the lecture doing, I suppose, was uh, looking at this so-called torsion uh, sequence, where you have this so-called Spencer differential here, and um, well, uh, this is very uh, not interesting for the Lorentzian case because both the kernel and the co-kernel, the co-kernel is where the uh, intrinsic torsion lives. So the kernel and the co-kernel are, are zero and that's just a restatement of the fundamental theorem of Riemannian geometry. But for Galilei the, and for Carroll, both the kernel and the co-kernel are equivalent as modules over the structure group. And in the case of Galilei, um, it's isomorphic to uh, the exterior square of the cotangent uh, representation. So we call V the tangent representation. So this is the dual V star. And in fact, what is the intrinsic torsion of an adapted connection? Well, it's it's really uh, D, the differential of the clock one form. So it's a two form, which is the differential of the clock one form. And it can be of three types, essentially. So it could be zero, so uh, torsion free. Uh, it could be maybe d tau is not zero, but yet d tau which tau is zero. And that's the, in physics, people call this twistless torsional, but this is the case where the kernel of tau is an integral distribution. And then there's the generic case. And in the Carolian case, again, their uh, kernel and co-kernel are isomorphic and they're isomorphic to, uh, as a module, to the symmetric square of the annihilator of this uh, distinguished vector field. And when you compute the uh, the intrinsic torsion, it looks like the lead derivative of uh, of this um, of this degenerate metric along the, the the vector field. And it can be of four types. It can, it can be generic, right? Otherwise, it could be that the lead derivative is zero, or it's proportional to the metric, or uh, it's trace traceless relative to a trace defined by the metric. And in in you know, then, then you get this uh, generically four different uh, four different kinds. Anyway, so that was what we did last time. So what I want to do today is to talk about some uh, some some new work. Let me. I, I wrote a bit of it just to have the the names of my the huge number of collaborators uh, written already. So this is this is work with a bunch of people that were in Groningen at least last year, and one who who is in Zagreb. Although I think he was in Vienna until until recently. So, and the, the subject is so-called P-brain P G-structure. So we're going to be discussing a kind of, and I'll explain, a kind of a P-brain generalization of uh, Galilei and Carolian structures. And um, so anyway, the people are the following. So Eric Bergshoff, uh, who is professor in Groningen, then there's Kevin, Kevin Van Helden, who's a PhD student, 
and Jan Rosel, who, who is uh, in Zagreb, Isaac Hirotko, who is an MSc student and has now fortunately decided not to continue doing uh, mathematics, so he's, uh, he's uh, gotten a job doing something else, software, some sort of software thing. And Tony Sterfelthaus, who, uh, although is from Groningen uh, natively, he, uh, he lives in the US and he was there on sabbatical. And anyway, I visited them in, in December, for, I spent there a week and we did a lot of calculations and it, it took us a while to kind of uh, get this written. But anyway, uh, anyway, so that, that's the idea. So I guess I should uh, perhaps explain now, uh, you know, at least kind of briefly what I mean by, by this uh, uh, P brains. So the, the, the idea is that the, the, the G structures that we talked last time, we, we take the view that they're appropriate for the description of particles. Uh, particles are, you know, a point, uh, you know, configuration space of a particle moving in Galilei space time well, is going to be, you know, uh, a point. Uh, and then particle trajectories are going to be sort of lines in Galilei space time. And the world line of a particle, you can think of the clock one form in Galilei space time, or rather its square, as giving you a kind of metric on the on this uh, world line of the of of the of the particles, but now the question is: Well, suppose instead of a particle, you look at a extended object. Could be a string, could be a membrane, which is a two brain, or could be you know uh, some object which is you know p dimensional. So that hence the word p brain. And as this object propagates in a space time, it uh, it, it 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 sweeps out a p plus one dimensional world volume. Uh, of the of the of the object, so um, now there's a lot one can say about this and what assumptions one makes and all that. So we 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 made some choices based on uh, the physical interest of my collaborators. I'm not claiming this is perhaps the mathematically most most general thing that one can do, but uh, what we what we made we made some assumptions, which at some point we should probably try to relax. But the assumption is the following: so we we have some sort of um, suppose you have some sort of, um, as I say, p-dimensional object propagating in some uh, in some uh, space time, and this is going to be tracing a is going to be sweeping this p plus one dimensional world volume. So let me think of that as uh, let me call it sigma the the p plus one dimensional world volume, and this is somehow embedded, let's say, in um, in in my in my manifold, which I guess the dimension n. And I'm going to assume that the I'm going to assume that the manifold is not is not necessarily Lorentzian. So the ambient manifold this could be a Galilei or well what what we're going to uh, define as a p brain Galilei uh, uh, g structure. But um, but we're going to assume and this is this is kind of an assumption is that sigma is Lorentzian. This, this, I think this has to be relaxed at some point, but for the purposes of today's talk, and that's because it's based on, on this work that I did with them, um, they were they were interested in um, in the case of uh, Sigma uh, Lorentzian. So, so we're going to assume that Sigma uh, has a Lorentzian metric. I don't know what to call it, maybe G, which is Lorentzian, uh, but M uh, not necessarily. In fact, uh, I'm going to de define what the natural G structure is. Okay, so let, let's let's let, let's assume that. Okay, so we have a Lorentzian structure on sigma. So uh, imagine you choose some uh, locally some local uh, orthonormal frames. So you know uh, theta, let's say zero. Well, maybe call it something else like bar theta. So suppose this is a uh, orth well, pseudo orthonormal frame. A co-frame, so one forms local, local orthonormal co-frame on, on sigma, so that the metric looks like minus, uh, you know, theta square plus theta one square plus blah, 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 right? And then okay, uh, we have this embedding, so just kind of like you know, let's let's push this uh, this uh, this uh, this co-frame. Um, so we have we have um, so so. What we can do is we can we can we can push this co-frame to 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 the manifold and extend them a little bit outside of or you know a, a, extend them away from the world volume of the of the p brain. So what we have is you know a bunch of frames. Let's say zero. So so p so 
and, and I'm going to extend them to uh, a frame, uh, a co-frame uh, for the whole of, uh, I guess n minus one, given that the whole thing is n. So, so, so this is this is like the image. So, so the, okay. So this is like the image of the. This is just motivation, by the way. I'll start doing serious mathematics in a moment. But um, so this is, the, the, this is the image of the thetas, and and this is just uh, completing to a to a co-frame. This is completion, and and this is defined in a neighborhood. Uh, in a neighborhood of uh, of sigma. In M, or the image of sigma. M. Okay, so um, right. So so the first thing is that. Uh, uh, Jose, what, Jose, yeah? Sorry, interrupt. What means push forward of one form? Okay, so the image. Let, let me put it. So the image, the image of sigma in. Think of sigma sitting inside M. So it's a sub manifold of of dimension p plus one. And I want these guys to be. Uh, I I want this. Um, okay, so I have a I have a tangent bundle of sigma, right? And I have cotangent bundle of sigma. So I'm going to choose a coframe, local coframe for the cotangent bundle of sigma, in such a way that the metric has this has this form. Uh, it's not pushing any. I mean, it's just. I mean. I, M is a manifold with some structure which I'm about to define, and then uh, what I have is a sub manifold in which I have a Lorentzian uh, metric. And because I have a Lorentzian metric on this sub manifold, I have a um, orthonormal coframe, and I'm going to extend the coframe a little bit out, you know, away from the sub manifold so, and and complete it to a coframe of of M. That's is that does that make more sense? Well, perhaps you mean they just you have some co, co, co frame on them, which in restrictions gives whatever you, you wrote, right? Okay, I have a think of it. Okay, think of it like that. Have a co frame on them, whose restriction to to um, I cannot restrict it to the sub manifold, and the first p of them, uh, uh you know, I could give me you know the 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 the, the expression that I've given here for for yeah. g to define a Lorentzian metric. Locally on on that sub manifold. Mm -hmm. that, right. That's that's Thanks. sort of the picture. Maybe yeah. I didn't explain it very well, but but that that's that's kind of the. It, it's I'm just motivating the, you know, the so okay so so what do I want? I want um. Well, the the kernel of the theta zero through theta p. This is going to be um. I want to, to to define so so okay so so I'm going to define uh, a a sub bundle of of the tangent bundle which is the which is the the common kernel of all the theta zero through theta p and. Then I'm going to uh, assume that on that, you know, um, let me call eta the minus, you know, it's kind of like the extension of, well, it's, it's, the, it's the Lorentzian metric on sigma, but extended away from it. So I have this, uh, so is it P squared like that? And I'm going to, uh, so what is this? This is a section of uh, the square of the uh, annihilator of E. And this is sitting inside a, what I, you know. And I'm also going to assume that on the, uh, okay, so what does this do? I mean, this defines, Right, so this defines uh, a Lorentzian metric at this local on on uh, TM mod E. And what else do I want? I want um, on. I want. I want. So this would be the analog. This is like a, you know, if P were zero, this would be. This eta would be the analog of minus tau squared, where tau is the clock one form. 
So that's that's kind of the thing to keep in mind. And then what I want is an analog of the ruler, right? I'm I'm after some sort of p brain Galilei structure. So I want the analog of the ruler. And what should be the ruler? Well, it should should be a Riemannian metric on uh, on e on this on this on this bundle. So uh, what do I call the Riemannian metric? Uh, I'm going to call it. I'm not going to call anything. The, okay, so I, I okay. Uh, the, the additional structure is a Riemannian metric. Let me just say, I'm not going to give it a name because what I'm interested in is the inverse of that. So Riemannian metric on E. But of course, uh, this would be a section of symmetric square of E star. But the dual of a sub bundle is a quotient bundle, right? So I want to I, I want to view this as a as a as an honest tensor on my manifold. So what I want to do is I want to invert. So the so the inverse, uh, it whose whose inverse. Let me call it uh, gamma, and this 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 does have a name. Um, it's going to be uh, the it, it's a section of so it's a it's a Riemannian metric on E star. So it's therefore a section of symmetric square of E, and this is sitting inside symmetric square of TN. So this, this guy is a tensor where the Riemannian metric on E is not. Okay, so um so that so so the so the option of this is the is the fact that okay, I have a manifold, I have a sub bundle of the tangent bundle, I have uh eta, which is a uh Lorentzian metric on sorry section of this guy and I later of E and I want this to be Lorentzian. So Lorentzian on TM E. And I have this gamma, which is a section of symmetric square of E. Um, and the idea is that gamma inverse is a Riemannian. By the way, Lorentzian and Riemannian, this is just for exposition. Uh, the important thing is that they should be non-degenerate. Um, but okay, for exposition, and because I'm taking a kind of a Galilei approach to to this, I, I want this Lorentzian and the other Riemannian. So it's a Riemannian uh, metric on on E. Okay, so that's basically the structure that I want, and I'm going to call this a a you know a a p brain. I'm going to call this a p brain Galilei structure. Um, but I, I can, I'll define it in terms of groups in a moment, but but let me just, um, so I'm gonna call this a P brain Galilei structure. And and by the way, so uh, the rank of E, the P comes in the rank of E, right? So the rank of E is going to be, if this is an N dimensional manifold, it's N minus P minus one. Anyway, so that's a basic. Uh, that's kind of like the basic uh, structure that I that I that I have. So let me now let, let me. This is kind of I'm going kind of backwards. So so now I'm going to tell you the sort of the, the the linear algebra behind this. What what is what is the? This is just motivating from the point of view of p brain. But now now I want to tell you a little bit more sort of seriously what the what the. Okay, so keep keep this in mind. I mean I mean I have a, you know. So the linear algebra is an n-dimensional vector space, a n minus p minus one dimensional subspace, and these kind of two inner products that I have, a Lorentzian one on the, you know, on the, on the symmetric square of the annihilator of the subspace, and then gamma, which is going to be in the symmetric square of the subspace, which I think of it as the inverse of a Riemannian metric um, on the subspace. Okay, so, uh, so let me now start really just you know, that, that was motivation, if you want. Now let's do uh, some more serious stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna start by defining um, as usual, uh, sorry, let me change color. Um, so I'm taking V to be, V with a double thing because, you know, anyway, uh, to be Rn, and I'm going to um, define um, some subspace, and W is the thing that corresponds to the subbundle E, so it's a subspace of V, and the dimension of uh, W is going to be N minus P minus one. That's the, and what I want is W to be, okay, so I'm, I'm going to define two uh, sort of exact sequences. So I'm going to have uh, W sitting inside V 
And I want to view W as what? As the kernel of eta. Eta is this inner, uh, is this, is this Lorentzian inner product on, you know, well, it would be a Lorentzian inner product on, on V mod W. So I'm going to say that it's the kernel of the, let's call it flat, if you don't mind. Uh, so this goes on a later report. Yeah. Right, so, um, yeah. So remember that eta, okay, so eta is going to be in the symmetric square of the annihilator of W. And this other guy that I have is, uh, I guess, uh, gamma, which is in the symmetric square of W. So the first of, the first thing I have is this. I mean that defines W as the kernel of uh, of of um, of eta flat, and I have a complement. Well, kind of a complementary um, sequence uh, for B star, which now has the other musical isomorphism of gamma. So this is mapping to W. So that's basically the, the linear algebra behind this. And notice that what, what this says, by the way, is that, and I'm not sure what the standard mathematical terminology for this, I call it an exact pair in, in, this, in this paper that I wrote with these guys, but I wasn't sure what to call it. But basically what I have is the following. I have V and V star, and I have two maps uh, between them. So, so one is um, one of this eta, the other one is gamma. And the kernel of one map is the image of the other. So what is the name of that? It's, I call it an exact pair, but I'm not sure. So if you know the better name, please let me know. Um, so, so the kernel of eta is the image of this, and the kernel of this guy is the image of eta one. Is not the only exact pair that we're going to see, but I thought I would introduce it here just because it's a simple notion and it's uh, it's, it's kind of nice. Okay, so um, so let me make some comments. So so eta induces a um, an inner product, which okay, it's Lorentzian in in but, but let's just say inner product um, on v mod w. And maybe it's it's good to call it something uh, else than eta, just not to confuse the two. So maybe let me let me let me just call it uh, eta bar. And gamma induces uh, an inner product, which I'm going to call, I guess, gamma bar. And this inner product is going to be on the dual of W. And um, I can invert it. So, uh, so uh, we can invert and define, let's say, H to be uh, inner product on W. And I insist that, and I'll do it in a different color, is that it, for exposition, I'm choosing this inner product to be Sorry, this, this inner product here to be Lorentzian, and this inner product here to be Euclidean. But uh, you don't have to do that. You could do, um, if, you, if you wanted to rephrase this whole thing in terms of P brain, Carol, well, it wouldn't be P brain, but if it's you know, Car P brain Carolian structure, let's say, you would take eta to be Euclidean and gamma to be Lorentzian, but let's not necessarily uh, do that. Or if you are interested in pseudo Galilean, pseudo Carolian, then you can you can take it to be any signature you want, provided that they're non-degenerate. Okay, so then the question is, um, so so let me define uh, G, which it, it's kind of the p brain Gal the p brain Galilei structure group to be uh, the subgroup of GLV that preserves uh, eta and so so this is going to be. This is this is um, all the I don't know what to call them. Uh, let's go A in GLV, uh, where A well A acting on eta is eta, 
and A acting on gamma is gamma, acting in the standard way. And then the question is, well, what is this group? Um, well, this group, ha let me let me tell you the structure. So it's Lie algebra. So so the Lie algebra of the of G, um, you, you you the best you the, the more the the most uh, correct thing you can say is that it's a it's a uh, abelian extension uh, of the following. So so we have the following exact sequence. We have a W tensor annihilator W. And then we have G and then the quotient, this is an abelian ideal. And the quotient is going to be uh, the, um, well, the SO of uh, W relative to this H inner product, which is the inverse of, of gamma bar and SO of uh, V mod W with eta bar. And this sequence splits, but the splitting is not canonical. But sometimes for calculations, you can choose a splitting and therefore you can view, let me let me then sort of identify what these guys would be. Uh, this, 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 this we normally call the longitudinal uh, Lorentz transformation. So this would be the Lorentz transformations on the world volume of the P brain, so to speak. This is the transverse rotations. So these are rotations in the, in the in the in in W, you know, in the transverse to the to the world volume, and these are the boosts. This would be kind of the the the, the P brain Galilei boost. So I'll 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 write them in the in a different color, just to you know, just this kind of the physical interpretation for these things. But but I'll put quotes on them because you know, uh, this this would be these are called transverse. Rotations, so longitudinal Lorentz transformations. Anyway, so that those are the kind of the physics, uh, physical interpretation of this. If you view if you view this as a as a Lorentzian p p plus one dimensional well volume of a of a p brain inside a p brain Galilei spacetime. Well, whatever. Anyway, so that's the that's the that that's the structure. So locally, it looks like the semi-direct product of the, you know, SO, you know, uh, this transverse rotations times the uh, uh, um, so direct sum the the uh, longitudinal Lorentz trans Lorentz algebra, and then semi-direct product this abelian ideal, which is which are the boosts. Okay. So, uh, and let me just say, so it splits, but not canonical. But sometimes you can just choose a splitting to look at. Okay, uh, so what else? So, okay, so basically that's the, so now we have G. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's given in a rather, perhaps uh, not very, I mean, it, it's given as this extension, but okay, we have a Lie algebra. We have this V. So we can uh, write down the torsion uh, exact sequence of so the Spencer differentials. We have all the all the, all the technology that we can now consider uh, the standard thing kernel, and then here we have G tensor now V star, and then V tensor lambda two V star, the Spencer differential, and the co-kernel. And what we did in this paper is basically analyze this. Uh, except that the, there's one case which is much more complicated, which we didn't finish, and that's going to be uh, something that we're, you know, call it work in progress. Although right now everybody's busy doing other things, but uh, in the new year we're, I'm going back to Groningen and hopefully uh, uh, finish this this other case, which is actually the case of the string. Funny enough, so the stringy Galilean, which perhaps is the most interesting of all the P-brain things. Uh, that that uh, is a much is slightly more complicated because the modules that appear are highly sort of reducible. I mean, you you get a lot more uh, sub modules than what I'm about to show you. But uh, when you when you when you split the the for example the co-kernel, this this has many many more uh, sub modules in the stringy in the stringy case. So uh, I will mention uh, as I tell you the results. Um, the um you know which cases uh, are are still not uh, sort of complete 
Okay, so I mean, I'm, I'm not. I'm just going to sort of summarize results. I'm not going to perhaps uh, you know prove these things. It takes take a long time. But um, let's let me tell you a few things about this this, this sequence uh, in the case of this deep brain Galilei thing. So uh, the first thing is, of course, um, um, so so as before, uh, we find that the kernel is isomorphic as a G module to the co-kernel. This is the case always because the dimension of the Lie algebra uh, agrees with the dimension of uh, the exterior squared of V. So just by euler poincare applied to this exact sequence, uh, you get that. The, the, well, at least, at least that the dimensions are the same. But then you can actually prove that they're related by, in fact, let me, let me tell you how they're related. So I'm going to define a map. Let me call it uh, phi uh, from, uh, from, from V tensor lambda to V star to, um, well, upright. at first it looks like, uh, sorry, at first it looks like um, endomorphisms of the tensor V star, but actually you can prove that it lands in the in those endomorphisms, which are which is the the, the Lie algebra G, right? Remember that G. So remember that G is subalgebra of GLV. So okay, uh, but let me define this uh, first of all, and then uh, I'll just state the fact that it it lives in in. So okay, so. If you have something here T, because this is the bundle of the torsion, so let's call it let's call the tensor T. This gets sent to something which I'm going to call phi sub T, for lack of a better name, and it's defined as follows. So um, okay, so it's a homomorphism from V to endomorphisms of V, right? So I I can say okay, suppose I have some vector V in V. So this is an endomorphism, so I can apply it to some other vector. And I get a vector. I, I get something in V. So let me contract it with something in V star. So here alpha is in V star. And I'm going to define this to be the following. So I'm going to use, uh, uh, so it's, it's going to be eta applied to T. Well, T is, uh, OK, so I'm going to take uh, V. And then um, what do I call it, H, I guess, or? No, I call it gamma star of alpha. Remember, uh, let me go back to this. Um, maybe it's good to remember these things. So um, this gamma uh, sharp uh, takes uh, V dual to W, right? So so this, this gamma sharp of alpha, this is in W. So this is TV and then uh, inner product with V prime and I symmetrize in V and V prime. So I'm gonna take this to be T of V prime, gamma sharp alpha V. I just define that. Um, and you can prove the following. So first of all, that uh, phi T of V actually lives in G. It's not just in endomorphisms of V, but actually in, 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 in the Lie algebra. So fact, you can prove it, it's not difficult, but I mean, it's just, okay. It lives in G. And um, so, so, so therefore, uh, let's use the same name. Phi actually takes V tensor uh, symmetric uh, uh, um, exterior squared of V star to G tensor V. Well, let me write it like this. So remember that we have a map going the other way. Uh, the Spencer differential. And what I claim is that these two spaces uh, form an exact pair, again. So another fact, sorry, I'm not proving them, but is is that, um, let me just bring it here. This guy's an exact pair. In other words, uh, the kernel of phi is precisely the image of the Spencer and the kernel of the Spencer is precisely the image of phi. And therefore, um, this uh, this uh, phi induces an isomorphism between the co-kernel and the kernel. So 
it follows that phi induces uh, and and of course phi is uh, it's, it's a g equivariant because if you look at phi what what is what is this map what what, what appears in the definition of um, yeah let's let's look what, what appears in the definition of uh, of 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 this phi well eta and gamma sharp and these are g invariant because by definition g is the subgroup of glb that preserves gamma and eta so it certainly preserves this uh, musical map and uh, and and eta so so yeah, this professor, is, yes i have a question about your long formula my long um, formula Yes, uh, so it seems like left hand side is skew symmetric in V and V prime. No, why? It's symmetric. Um, but how how is phi t defined? So phi t is a map from uh, V to endomorphisms. So I put in an element of V and I get an endomorphism, so it can act. Yeah, but how is it defined through through t? What happens if you put phi t of v and then v prime what is the formula uh, sorry t. say that again what is what it seems that phi t of v applied to v prime is the same as t of v comma v prime no no because t is applying to v and it, it somehow knows about alpha so so t is only applying to to V and the element in W that you get by applying yeah the, this formula right hand side is symmetric I just about how you define this map phi. So it is, sorry, it is. Well, do you, do you agree that, do you agree that if I, if I know this quantity for all alpha V and V prime, then I know what yeah. phi is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's phi definition is. of phi t, right? That's definition of phi t. Right. So okay, phi so is defined, defined by taking t to phi t. Yeah, yeah, okay, good, thank you. Okay, so uh, what was I saying? So, yeah, so because the, right, so the kernel of, so so the the kernel of phi is the image of of, of the Spencer. So by the first isomor force, isomorphism theorem, I get, uh, induce an isomorphism um, uh, of the G modules, one, um, from the co-kernel, right? Which is V mod the image. So that's V mod the kernel of phi uh, to the kernel of uh, D, which is the image of phi. Well, let me say the image of phi, which is the kernel of D. So that shows that the kernel and the co kernel are, um, are um, isomorphic as G modules. So uh, now you have to believe me that you can, uh, so in generic dimension, i.e., not for strings, so not when p is one, or indeed when p is minus. Uh, there's two k. Okay, generic, generically, and generically. What what does that mean? It says uh, p not equal to one or p not equal to n minus three, um, which are the so p p is equal to one are the Galilean stringy geometries, the stringy Galilean geometries. And P is n minus three co corresponds to the Carolian uh, um, stringy geometries in this language. So there's kind of a duality. So so um, yeah. But anyway, um, let's so so generically, uh, we we have um, so the Cocker D has. Uh, the following uh, ha has the following uh, submodules. So, okay, zero. Then I'm going to call them something, and then I'm going to tell you what each of them are. So, I'm going to call this T trace. It's a bit like the Carolian case for the particle, by the way. Uh, T is T, T traceless, except now we have T and then we have uh, Coker D. What happens in the case of P equals one or P equals n, n minus three? I think it's n minus two. I'm misremembering. I think it's or maybe n minus two. I don't. I, don't, I need to. No, n minus three. Sorry, it's correct. P equals one and n minus three. What happens is that uh, some of these modules are they're not uh, irreducible, so they contain some some additional sub modules. Essentially, because for example, so so the the fundamental thing here is that that in one plus one dimension, 
the Lorenz group uh, doesn't act, it, act does, it acts reducibly on the on the vector representation. In two dimensions, the the you know you could the, the the you can find a basis which is co corresponds of null vectors, and the Lorentz group all they do is they rescale uh, reciprocally these two uh, these two um, null vectors. So it actually breaks up into two one dimensional uh, real representations rather than a irreducible two dimensional one. And what happens is that whenever uh, W or the annihilator of W is two dimensional. Then, uh, then, then the, 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 this this thing breaks up further into 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 submodules. So that that's why, but it only happens when p is one or p is n minus three, um, and provided that the inner product induced on W or an annihilator of W is Lorentzian. So whenever either W is Lorentzian and dimension two or an analytic of W has a Lorentzian metric, which is dimen uh, uh, dimension two. Both of these cases, uh, there are more submodules than what I've written down. But in general, this is what you have. And okay, um, so maybe, um, maybe I go to the next page and just basically tell you what, what, how they are defined. So I'll copy this again. Um, copy. I'll put Put it here. Okay. So right. So so okay. So zero. So what does that mean? Well, uh, it says that. Okay. So I'll just I'll just tell you what they look like in terms of. Um, so this is just you know this thing zero. So. And the, the notation is such that um, when I write a little w, this is in w, and otherwise it's in v. OK, so that's 0. Uh, t, let's start with t, which is, OK, the, 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 the generic one is just the generic one. So we're, we don't have to worry about the, the, the co-kernel, the generic one. But, but let me, um, this, this, um, this t, by the way, sorry, I should have maybe made, uh, uh, let me, let me, um, so what is this t? t is just the direct sum of the, this is t zero plus. So. Okay, so what is t? Well, t is the following. It says that eta of, when now, now you put in two elements of w, so w, w prime here, and then this should be zero. And this is for all w and w prime and w and v and v. Uh, T trace, let's say. So T trace uh, basically says that uh, this business here that is zero, it's now no longer zero, but it's okay. So copy. So this guy is no longer zero, but rather is proportional to. Um, so how, how do I want to write this? I want to write it as okay. There's some inner product W W prime, and then eta V V. And this is for some W and W, and it's for all W, sorry, for all W prime and W, and for all W and W and V, V prime and V. Okay. And uh, T zero, well, I need to perhaps explain uh, a bit of notation here. So I'm going to say that um, this is such that if you put in two things in W, you get uh, zero, but then um, I want to say that the eta trace of t is, that, is equal to zero. And I want to tell you what the eta trace is. The eta trace is not a number. It's an element of the dual of w. So the, the this is zero, but this is zero in w star. And I'm, I'm going to define, let me, let me, OK, first of all, this is for all w, w prime in w and v in v. But let me tell you what this uh, trace uh, thing is defined. So T is an element in V tensor lambda to V star. Okay, so um, I claim that this defines a linear map um, from W, I guess, to uh, 
symmetric square of B star. Uh, so this, this is DW goes to something I'm gonna call TW. And what is TW? TW of VV prime is going to be, uh, well, the thing that I just wrote, uh, eta of, I guess is what I call phi. Well, okay, that's not. Uh, so what is it? It's, it's eta of T VW V prime plus eta of T V prime W V. Right? So I'm going to find this like that. Oops, sorry. Okay, so um, so if if T is in T, right? Which is the sum of T zero and T trace, uh, then uh, I guess, uh, so if T is in, and if, okay, so what do I want to say? If, so suppose that, uh, if either V or V prime actually lives lives in W, uh, then uh, TW is equal to zero, right? Why? Because, well, uh, if T is in T, remember what T is defined, T, T is in T is the same thing as saying that uh, uh, T of W, W prime lives in W because W is the kernel of eta flat and anything who's in any any vector who's in our product with all the vectors is zero is in the kernel of eta flat and therefore that's W. So, so it says that this guy's in W. Okay, so imagine that uh, either V, so suppose, suppose either V or V prime is in W and T satisfies, uh, is in T, so, so it satisfies this condition. Then, okay, suppose V is in W, then here we have so V is in W means this 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 inner, this this second term is vanishes because W uh, is in the radical of eta, but um, but here if V is in W, uh, T of V W is in W and again it's in the radical so you get zero and by symmetry if it's if V prime is in W then you also get zero, so actually what you get uh, is a um, when T is when T is in T what 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 you get is um, is a map from W to the uh, symmetric square of the annihilator of W. But we have a preferred element in the annihilate in the symmetric square of the annihilator of W, namely eta itself. So, so this guy breaks up into uh, eta and uh, what we what, what we could call the symmetric traceless uh, thing. So, so the, there's a complementary uh, uh, representation. And um, and what is the trace? So 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 if you if you look at the component along eta, that's the eta trace of t. So it's really a it's really a map between, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an element in W star. So if you look at if you look at uh, if you look at this, um, so trace eta of t is the uh, is the R eta component. Of this map, and we we basically we want this to be zero in the in the in the t zero thing. Okay, so this this is kind of the algebraic characterization of these modules. And now, in the last ten minutes, let me tell you what the geometric what 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 the geometric characterization is. So, um, okay, so let's just maybe I should. Um, sorry, uh, I should copy again this drawing so that we can look at it. Um, so that the thing that I wrote before was just the algebraic characterization of the submodules. Now I'm going to tell you what 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 happens. So geometrically. Okay, so so W uh, gives this uh, sub bundle of TM, right? So W is a G sub module of the tangent representation. So you get the associated vector bundle to this module is a sub bundle of uh, of TM, which we call E, and uh, any adapted connection preserves uh, E. So that's another fact, but this is a typical fact of G structure. I'm not going to prove it. So 
So any uh, adapted affine connection uh, preserves E in the sense that if X is a section of E and Y is any vector field, nabla Y X is again a section of E. So that, that we're going to use. So we have this sub bundle and we have a connection that preserves it. And, uh, but, but of course, the, the, con the connection also uh, annihilates eta and gamma, these two tensors that, that, that we have flying around. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about the, the generic case, generic torsion. There's nothing I can say, but uh, let's, let's, let's see what happens when uh, the torsion uh, is in T. So, well, that says that the, so, so, okay. So if the intrinsic torsion, let me just call it T of, it, it, it's in T, you know, already the, the equivalence class of the torsion, the intrinsic torsion is in T, then this is the same thing as saying that uh, E is in volume. In other words, uh, if X and Y are sections of E, the Lie bracket of X and Y, is also a section of E. So why is that? Well, let, let's just, that, that's easy to see. So um, so uh, so this guy looks like what? This looks like nabla XY minus nabla YX, I guess, minus the torsion. But if X and Y are sections of E, so the, the, the condition on the torsion, the algebraic condition says that, remember, if you plug in two things in W, the torsion tensor is in W. So in other words, if you plug in two sections of E, the torsion tensor applied to that is uh, again a, a section of E. So so this is a section of E. And of course, uh, these two guys are, because of what I just said, that the connection preserves D, these, these are also sections of E. Therefore, this is a section of E. Okay, so that that's that that's that bit. That's that's kind of the nice the nice thing. And then uh, I need to tell you in the last uh, few minutes just what what about the other ones. So um, what if the uh, intrinsic torsion lives in uh, sorry what I call it? trace part? Okay, so this is very similar to the Carolian thing that we did last time, and it all follows. Uh, okay, let me let me just state them, and then I'll tell you why it follows. Uh, well, one one requires a calculation. Sorry, one requires a calculation, so I won't do that in detail, but the other one is just a simple thing. Um, okay, so if this guy is in the in the trace bit, uh, what it says is that if I compute the lead derivative of eta along a section of E, uh, this is going to be uh, proportional to eta. Let me just say proportional to eta um, for all x sections of E. So this is analog to the to the conformal case or whatever we call an umbilical case in the Carolian, but except that there we just had one. There we just had you know E was was one dimension was rank one, which is the 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 Carolian vector field, but here we have a larger higher rank distribution, and we need to, you know, ensure that this is true for all of them. So this proportionality constant, of course, is so it's a one form applied to X. Uh, okay, so what about if um, this guy is in T0? Well, then I claim that th this is the case that requires a calculation I'm not going to tell you. Uh, I claim that this is, is the same thing as a certain volume form uh, uh, being zero. So, so omega is a section of the top exterior power of the annihilator of E. And it's the uh, it, it's this this is this is relative to a co-frame in the G structure. This looks like uh, you know the Lorentzian volume form. It looks like lo locally it looks like this. And uh, if it's closed, right? It doesn't have to be closed necessarily. But if it's closed, then the, the intrinsic torsion lives in this uh, traceless class. This is what we call minimal, but. Some somebody complained, but <laughs> but this is what that we normally it, what you know in, in in surface theory. I guess you would call it minimal surface. Um, and finally, what happens if uh, this guy is uh, is equal to zero? Well, then the the lead derivative of eta along a, every section of E is equal to zero. So um, 
this just follows by doing a calculation, which is very similar to the calculation I did I did last time. You basically compute Lx eta on say yz, where yz could be any two vector field, but but x has to be a section of E. And uh, you compute this, uh, you know, dot, 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 like we did last time, except there was only, last time X was only uh, kappa. But if you if you follow this, you find that this is precisely eta of T nabla uh, X, Y, Z, plus eta of T nabla, I guess, X, well, we can, Y, T nabla, X, Z, something like that. So just like last time except X here could be any section of E, whereas before X was kappa. So, so see last lecture, the same calculation. Okay, so that, that tells you kind of geometrically uh, what, what the different uh, P-brain Galilei G structures are based on their intrinsic torsion. Um, I claim that the stuff we did last time, Galilei and Carolian actually follow from these by taking a special cases. So I'll finish with that, if you don't mind. Um, so how to recover what we did last time from this? So let me tell you the what the special cases are. So, uh, so, so, so uh, special cases. Uh, okay, p equals zero. This is this is uh, Galilean G structure, uh, like last time. So. So what we did last time is the zero brain uh, version. So what happens here? Well, it's of course done in a slightly different language because here what we use was eta, which is this kind of Lorentzian metric on the world volume. But uh, last time in the Galilei case, we had tau, which is a one form. So, so eta is minus tau squared or tau squared if you want, whatever. So eta is basically tau squared. That's the thing you should keep in mind. And then, um, and then E uh, is actually the kernel of tau. And here, what happens is that um, the uh, the involutivity is the same thing as as uh, trace actually. And uh, there is no, I guess there is no. Uh, The annihilator of E is one dimension. So symmetric square of annihilator of E is, um, sorry, it's rank one. So, it's, so symmetric square only has eta. So if, if, if it's traceless, it means the eta component is zero, but that's the only component, therefore it has to be zero. So, so, so you get this, this, this degeneracies, right? And then what happens is that, okay, so if, you, if you go back to our uh, drawing where we had zero, whatever, like this. Then what happens is is that okay, oh, I'm almost done. Uh, if what happens is that um, these two guys are the same, and these two guys are the same. So what you end up with is basically this collapses to something like, you know, sorry, this collapses to 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 the old case. I mean, we have basically zero then something which we could call the involutive one and then concurrently, right? That, that looks like that. And the other important, the other case, the Carolian case is when P is N minus two. In other words, N minus two says the world volume is co-dimension one. So um, a domain wall in the physics parlance. So a, a Galilean domain wall is essentially a Carolian particle and vice versa. So when you do this, when, when P is, and then, then what happens is that the rank of E is one. So of course, uh, it is trivially uh, integrable, uh, involutive, sorry. So, so, so that says that this uh, involutive is in fact uh, the generic one. So there's no, it's always, it's always involutive. So, so basically what you have is this, this situation where you have uh, the, the trace, I keep calling it R, but I meant trace, um, zero, and then here just cocur D. And that's that's the, exactly the same thing we had before with the uh, Carolian case. And let me just finalize by saying that uh, this is incomplete 
um, for uh, p is equal to one and p is equal to n minus three. And uh, these are the stringy, this is this is called so-called stringy Galilean and this is stringy Carolian. And this is something I hope to finish uh, doing in, in the new year once everybody's a bit freer. Okay, so uh, I'll finish here. I think this is uh, what I can tell you about these uh, e brain things at this moment. I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Any questions? No questions. Uh, maybe maybe I have a question. Um, so um, what's that? What kind of interesting problems are there around in the in the area? Well, I mean, I have to say that I'm slightly agnostic about this whole p-brain thing. I would like to understand the stringy case better, just because. Well, um, I'm interested in non-relativistic strings, so constructing conformal field theories that describe strings propagating on on non-relativistic space, non-Lorentzian space times. Um, so that, that's kind of a separate problem is that, uh, that there's a slightly more kind of physics here, I suppose. Um, I suppose, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a question. When, when, when I suggested the topic, I tell you, this was a little bit niche. I mean, I'm not sure that this, is, this has some uh, universal uh, interest. Uh, but the, my collaborators, they they like pea brains, and they asked me this question, and I I spent there a week, uh, you know, working these things out with them. So uh, you would have to ask them why they're really interested in pea brain Galileo. I I guess okay. There there's a the the, the thrust of the work these days going on in non Lorentzian geometries is is, is trying to do. Uh, trying to see what the non-Lorentzian analog of all the stuff that we've known for the last century uh, uh, no, based on Lorentzian physics, right? So uh, GR, for example, or quantum field, relativistic quantum field theory, what does, or or, or string theory, what do these things look like uh, in the non-Lorentzian world? So we, we've got pretty good idea already about sort of quantum field theories and things like that. I mean, there, there's a lot of progress being done string not so much and p brains very little and partially is because well there's not much known about p brains uh, really except uh, as solutions of supergravity theories but again supergravity very little is known in the non lorentzian world so i don't know what to tell you i mean what what i i can tell you what i'm interested in i'm interested in understanding i'm interested in in, in understanding uh non-Lorentzian non string theory in the same language that I use for Lorentzian string theory, namely uh, vertex operator algebras and conformal field theory. So that's the that's the stuff that I'm personally interested in, uh, in in this beyond the particle case. So beyond the beyond the, I mean, beyond the particle and field theories, which is all basically particle type. I mean. They're not the same thing, but I mean, you know what I mean. So in this, in this, in the in p p equals zero, mo mostly I'm interested in p equals zero and p equals one, and but but if if for example if if you know these are some interesting and well defined uh, g structures, you may want to study them. Uh, maybe the, you know mathematically they 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 appeal to somebody, in which case okay it could be interesting to to study them further. Um, I'm from a from my perspective, I cannot tell you of anything that I'm really uh, eager to know about these things. <laughs> let me let me put it this way. I'm 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 interested in the in the stringy ones just because it, it that that I think uh, when you try to construct string theories by sigma models, then I think they 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 do play a role. You may have to impose uh, some uh, intrinsic torsion constraints to get a to get a you know to make progress so it maybe, maybe more more more, more concrete. you know which uh, which constraints you can impose sorry uh -huh. Uh -huh. maybe more concrete questions so like uh what kind of interesting differential equations are behind right in, in, in this business um 
Okay, so tell me what 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 for you is an interesting differential equation in. Well, for example, in relativity is the most important. Uh, like the GR. The GR. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the way we one way to define GR is by sort of what we we call gauging. So you gauge a particular. Um, so gauging, by the way, is constructing a Cartan geometry based on one of these uh, homogeneous models. Um, uh, and and you can you know you can you can you can derive in effect uh, the Einstein equation for example by uh, by gauging uh, by con by con what we call in physics the gauging procedure but mathematically it's really just constructing a Cartan Cartan geometry including the Cartan connection um, and then uh, what you can That's do is you can write down some is it you, you can write down some variational problem. Sorry for this Cartan connection, and you can vary, and you can, and you can look at the variational equations, and you get the Einstein equations this way. Uh, so, so, so you could do this with any G structure. Right? I mean, take the Galilei, the the Ponis, I don't know if that would give you some interesting uh, PDEs, to be honest. Um, but I suppose people could do that. I mean, they can, they can, you can, you can. This algebra that I gave you is well, no, gauge this algebra in the sense of constructing a Cartan geometry. Uh, you can then write down um, uh, variational problems for this, uh, you know, by looking at sort of uh, invariant uh, differential forms or whatever, uh, made out of the curvature and the torsion of the Scartan connection, and you can um, you can um, you can solve the variational equations, and you you might get some. We we did this with, with Carolian, for example. So we 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 uh, we wrote down some Carolian gravity equations whether you call them interesting or not i don't know they're not as they're, of course they're not they haven't been as studied as the einstein equation so we don't know much about the, the kind of solutions that they admit but um, but in principle the equations are there and one could try to, to study them so in, in physics that's the i guess that's the way people they they, they you, you you get one of these uh, g structures you basically uh, write down some variational principle for the torsion and, and curvature of the associated uh, Cartan connection and you and you see what you get. And so, we know that uh, if we do this for Lorentzian, we get we get GR. So you, you say Cartan connection, so is it equivariant? Yeah, yeah. Car strictly speaking, it's really Cartan connection uh, with, so, so you take one of these uh, homogeneous models, like, uh, I mean, by the way, you, I mean, I didn't talk about this in, I mean, I didn't talk about the homogeneous model of the Bieber and Galilei space time, but there is a Bieber and Galilei space time, which is, well, it's the naive thing. You take an affine space and you, you, you consider this eta and, you know, take, take the kind of the affine version of this. Anyway, that, that is invariant under, um, under a P brain Galilei group, which is not the, the group. G here is the homogeneous people in Galilei group, so there are no translations. But I mean, you can affinize this at the translations, and you get the people in Galilei group. You can gauge that, and and you can say you can ask what what equations you you might get. In fact, when you do this for Galilei, you don't get anything very interesting. Um, but the thing with Galilei is that it has a central extension, which is the Barkman group, and then when you gauge Barkman, you do get something that is. Uh, uh, apparently, inter interesting. It's connected to Newton-Cartan gravity. So, um, my colleague Yele Hartung he gauged Carroll, but he it wasn't exactly the gauging that we. I mean, he did something a little bit different. But I mean, you can gauge Carroll, and you also get this sort of Carrollian gravity theories. You can, in principle, gauge the p-brain Carrollian or p-brain Galilei and see what you get. I haven't haven't done that. And you might get interesting, uh, in, interesting equations. I don't know. Anyway, that's that's my physics sort of person. My my physics, uh, my inner physicist talking. <laughs> I mean, this is what I would do um, to get equations. It's just basically starting from one of these things, just gauging, gauging, and writing down uh, invariant uh, gauge 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 invariant actions and looking at the variational problem. Any other questions for Jose? If not, let's thank uh, Jose again for his series. Well, thank you guys.